All right, North Lakers, good morning. Welcome to our outdoor service. All you sitting under the trees, you didn't need to today. God provided the shade. Don't you love that marine layer? And welcome, it is so great to have you here with us. I'm excited to worship together, open up God's word, and yes, the baptistry is out. We have a baptism this morning. It's gonna be a great, great morning. Um, as we get started, would you stand up to your feet? Everybody stand up. You're going to have enough time sitting down a little later. But I love these words out of Psalm 96. And I can just imagine King David writing these words. Somebody who had passion for Jesus. A man after God's own heart. And this is his call to worship for the nation of God's people, which we are a part of. It says this. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all all the earth that's right even creation is crying out for god sing to the lord praise his name proclaim his salvation day after day declare his glory among the peoples and our god is glorious for great is the lord and most worthy of praise a little bit later he says this in the same psalm ascribe to the lord all you families of nations ascribe to the lord glory and strength Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad and the sea and all that is in it. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth, to judge the world in righteousness and the people in faithfulness. And that is exactly what we're going to do this morning, is to sing to the Lord through worship and music, and to ascribe to him the glory due his name. So before we do anything, join with me in a word of prayer. Father God, we are gathered here today, your church, your people that you have adopted into your kingdom, and we are here to ascribe glory and honor and strength to you. It is all due you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, let's sing it out with a loud voice. Sound. 
Nothing is 
going to encourage you in your own heart, in your own mind, give your praise and worship to him this morning. Just tell God how much you love him. Name the things that you are thankful for, and let's give him praise. God, we praise you, and we thank you that you are with us. Your word says that you ascend amidst shouts of joy, that as we worship you, your presence inhabits us. So come, fill us, Lord. We need your strength. In Jesus' name. Hosanna, Hosanna, 
welcome him now. through this series all summer called Trust the Process. And if I'm guessing right, we all have areas in our lives where we find it very hard to trust God, to really trust that He knows better than we do. So I'm going to ask you just to take a moment of prayer right now. And whatever that thing is, whatever that area of your life, maybe it's a job situation or a financial situation or a health or maybe your children, Whatever it is that you have a hard time letting go of, let's just bring those things to the Lord right now. Ask Him to take from us the worry we feel and replace it with His peace. Just go to Him right now. Father God, I offer my prayer on behalf of everyone hearing these words right now, that you would help all of us to trust in you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. Lord, when those worries start to creep in, when we start to feel out of control, remind us that we aren't in control, but we can trust you because you are good God, a loving God, full of mercy, abounding in love. Help us, Lord, to trust you more and more. In Jesus' name. We're going to wrap up with this song. It kind of fits that theme. And I just encourage you to use these words, trust in you, as a way to continue that idea, that thought, that prayer, that you will give God everything. Allow him to take it from us.
part of our morning. I'm going to turn things over to Pastor Josh. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Josh. If I haven't met you or said hello to you, I'm one of the pastors here at North Lake, and we have something very special happening today. We have our baptismal set up because we have a baptism today. And anytime we do a baptism at church, um, I always like just to take one minute and explain what in the world baptism is. Because uh, this act of submerging somebody in water is, is kind of an interesting one. Uh, but what I always tell everybody is that baptism is to a relationship with Jesus what a wedding ceremony and a wedding ring is to a relationship with another person in marriage. You see, in marriage... You date somebody, you have a relationship with them, and then after a time, you make a commitment to them. And usually what you do is you gather your friends and family around, you say your vows before everybody, and then from then on out, you wear a wedding band. Now, if you don't wear a wedding band, does that mean you're not married all of a sudden? No, because then a lot of us would be in trouble if we were ever caught with our wedding rings off, right? But we wear that in pride and in saying that I'm declaring to the world, this is the commitment that I've made. Baptism is saying to the world, this is the commitment I've made, putting my trust in Jesus. And today we have somebody very special coming up to get baptized. So Nate, go ahead and come on up. Come on over here. I'm going to try not to get some feedback in here. Uh, so uh, hopefully you guys can see over there. Nate is one of our middle school leaders. Um, but before Nate was a middle school leader... I remember Nate showed up as I was the high school pastor here. You can take off your shoes and jump in, Nate. And uh, just don't go too far in. Don't ruin the moment, okay? Um, I was a high school pastor, and um, usually we hung out at the beginning of our gatherings on Sunday night. And I remember seeing this guy named Nate. And you can, here, I'll take your hand, buddy. Yeah. Um, and Nate showed up with a friend, and I just remember thinking, this is a pretty cool dude. He's, uh, Nate's pretty quiet, um, but Nate has a laugh that is contagious. And... I will never forget uh, Nate, uh, after getting plugged into our youth group, went to Guatemala with us, and I got to know Nate very, very well, and now we are good friends. And the coolest thing is just to see Nate's relationship with the Lord grow. And me and Nate started a small, uh, small group with another guy, Zach Gazda, as just a small men's group, and we were talking about baptism. And uh, me and Zach were talking about getting baptized, and Nate just goes, I haven't been baptized yet, and I need to get baptized. And we're like... Yeah, and uh, he told us about his cousin and your uncle, right, that got baptized a couple months ago, and they're here today, right? They are. 
Yeah, and uh, Nate talked about how cool that was to see you guys get baptized, and he's like, I don't know what I'm waiting for. I need to, I need to do this, right? And uh, so anyway, that's what has brought us here today. So, um, Nate, I, I told a little bit about you, but I think you need to share. Nate, why are you coming here today to be baptized? Well, for me, this is a day that isn't just about... Um, just about being dunked in water um, because every time I think of being baptized I always remember uh, this is a little silly I always remember the scene from Nacho Libre uh, where he goes and baptizes his friend um, and so it, it's important to be here but for me it's about expressing my faith and to all of you as uh, as my witness and it's proclaiming my love for Jesus that I believe in him and there's nothing else that will ever change that. Awesome. And uh, Nate, I have some very simple questions for you. <laughs> Nate, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God and have you accepted his sacrifice for your sins? Yes. And do you believe that he is the only way that you can have a relationship with God? Yes. All right, Nate. Well, based on those two simple questions, I'm now going to baptize you. But first, I'm going to set down the microphone so I don't fry both of us. All right. I'm going to sit down Nate, right here. I can. All right, Nate. Based on your profession of faith, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with Christ and raised to walk a new life. So I just have one simple question. If you are a follower of Christ and you have not yet been baptized, you've got like one or two more gorgeous sunny Sundays. We would love to set this thing up for you next week. So just let us know. Um, before Josh comes to wrap up our series, that's right, we're wrapping up our series today on Trust the Process, uh, we have something we want to tell you about. You're dried off already. Why don't you tell them about it? It's going to be fun. Dinner groups. Yeah, uh, we got something called dinner groups coming up, uh, and it's the first two weekends in September, and it's the realization for a lot of us with COVID and all of 2020 and 2021 and for the next 10 years straight, just kidding, we're going to get over this. Um, we've missed community, and we realize a great way to have community is just simply sharing a meal with other people in our church. So if you're sitting here today and you go, you know what, I do miss the community of hanging out with others, jump online on our website and you can sign up to do one of two things. One, you can sign up and say, I want to have two or three other couples come over and have dinner at my house and I would love to prepare a meal for them. Or you can sign up to say, I would love to go to somebody's house and eat all their food, right? Yeah. Uh, Pastor Luke has never been more excited for any event that we've ever done. I think we have four nights of going of, of, that you can have people over to your house. So Luke will probably come to all of your homes if you uh, are interested in hosting. But seriously, sign up online. We'd love just to spend time with one another. And the goal, again, is just for us to connect together with some other believers. All right, I, am, I have the great privilege of teaching today. If you remember last week, Mike said Pastor Luke was teaching today. And uh, I think Luke came to me, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. He's like, man, I got a lot going on. Do you mind teaching and wrapping up our series? I was like, dude, I would love to. So today, we are talking about somebody who has trusted the process really well. If you've been with us for any of the last seven weeks, every summer we do a special series. Normally, we just move through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter. Uh, but we take a pause and do some character studies. And we looked at people in the Old Testament. We looked at Peter right before Jesus died. But the person we're looking at today is the Apostle Paul. And I think Paul's life and example are really important for us to understand because he is somebody who trusted the process after this new understanding of who Jesus is. And Paul lived in basically the same era that we are living in, in the sense of Jesus has come back from the dead, he has gone up into heaven, and we know that God is returning, and we have a calling and a duty to live until he returns. Before we jump in, though, I want to start with a story. And it starts with about 20 people sitting in a room at a summer camp, and a guy standing up before all of them and saying these words. We will walk, you will trust us, and all will rest. 
And that might sound odd, but what we were doing was an informational meeting about a hike that you were able to do at our summer camp. You see, I grew up every summer going to a summer camp called Camp Zanika. And if anybody has heard of Camp Zanika, you are my new best friend. Let's hang out. We'll talk all about life. This was a, uh, it was a Campfire Girls or Campfire USA camp over in Wenatchee area. My mom grew up going to that camp. My grandma was super involved in it. And so for me, since I was in kindergarten, I would go to this summer camp every summer, at least a week or two weeks. And I absolutely loved going to camp. And you see, camp was down on a lake, and across from it was this beautiful mountain, and everybody would talk about how it was called Dirty Face. And the reason is if you looked at the mountain just the right way, like, and stepped a little to the side and squinted your eyes, you could kind of see a face up there. I never saw it, but they always told me it was there. Um, But the coolest part was that every Friday morning, so Friday morning, I think, was the last day of camp, every Friday morning, all the campers would go down to the dock, and a van would show up, and all these dirty sweaty kids and leaders would come out because they had that night starting at midnight gone and hiked up dirty face came back down and then the uh usual thing was they'd get out of the van and all of them would go jump in the lake and i remember since i was a little kid thinking that is the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life right These people were celebrating them, were cheering them, they're jumping in the lake with all their clothes on. They just did this awesome thing. They climbed that mountain. And I think I was in first grade and I was like, yep, I'm doing it. I'm going to climb dirty face. And they looked at me and they said, no, you are not. You see, you had to be either going into, I think it was fourth or fifth grade in order to climb dirty face. There was no physical requirement. It was only your age. And I was so frustrated by that. Because I looked at these boys and girls who were signing up to go climb Dirty Face, and I was like, these guys look like a bunch of chumps. Like, I could climb that in my sleep, but these guys, are you sure you want to take them and not me? I'm a pretty awesome third grader. You see, a little bit about Dirty Face. This is a nine-mile round-trip hike that has 4,000 feet of elevation. It is known to be covered in bugs, and that's why they have to start at midnight. And anybody who sets out, there is no turning back. You have to make it to the top. So when my fourth grade year came and I sat down at that meeting, I was a little nervous but very excited, and I'll never forget hearing, we will walk, you will trust us, and all will rest. And I remember him saying, you should only set out on this trip if you are certain that you will complete it. Anybody can make it. But you have to be willing to trust us. I'll tell you a little bit more about that hike a little later on. But the reason I tell you that story is that those three principles, we will walk, you will trust, and all will rest. As I was thinking about the Apostle Paul's life, I think he lives out those three things in his relationship with the Lord. And I think those three truths really set up each of us on how we should walk with the Lord every day. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into our time together. Lord, I really do thank you that we can gather together, God, that we can gather together outdoors and sing in this beautiful day. I couldn't have picked a better day for us to gather together. God, I just pray that you would go before us as we worship you just in studying your word, and God, just coming around the truths of scripture that you have for us. So Lord, we give you this morning. In your name, amen. Now, a little bit of context before we talk about the Apostle Paul. Whether you've grown up in church and heard about Paul a lot, or maybe you haven't grown up in church, a lot of people have heard his name. But he started out life as a man named Saul. And the thing you have to know about Saul is that he was a devout Jew. And he wasn't just a devout Jew, he was a Pharisee. And Pastor Mike talked about the Pharisees last week a little bit. And these were Jews that were wholly devoted to preserving the way of Yahweh. They looked at the teaching of Moses, they would memorize the first five books of the Bible, and they wanted in every way for their lives to perfectly follow the Lord. And Paul was like the gold standard of being a Pharisee. He was a man who honored the Lord in everything he did, and he was so radical for preserving the way of Yahweh that he wanted to kill and murder anybody who was putting forth a new way. So when this man Jesus came on the scene, and Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, 
God in the flesh that the Jews heard were coming. Paul heard that and instantly said, he is totally lying to everybody, this man named Jesus. All of his followers are trying to pull people away from following the one true way. We need to kill them to stop this. And we read in scripture that Paul was so devoted to the Lord in his own mind that he justified killing tons of Christians. And in doing so, it kind of elevated him in the Jewish church. And then a radical thing happens. In Acts chapter 9, Paul's minding his own business, and out of nowhere, it says he was struck blind. And it says the heavens opened, and he heard the Lord say, Paul, why are you persecuting my people? And he was like, what? And in that moment, we read that God says, Paul, Jesus is the Messiah. You've missed the train, man. You've messed up. And so Paul then, in his blindness, gets taken to a house. He meets a man named Ananias. And then Paul, it says, scales fall from his eyes, and he comes to know the Lord. And right after he comes to know Jesus and puts his trust in Jesus, he would have probably been baptized just like our friend Nate was. And Paul is now living a new life. He gets a name change, and he says, I want to tell everybody about Jesus. So he goes to the Jewish synagogue where he would have gone and gathered people and rallied them around the one true way of Yahweh and saying, let's go kill anybody who doesn't follow us. He goes to the synagogue and he tells all of them, hey, everybody, yeah, um, I messed up. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Jesus is real. And we read in Acts chapter 9, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night, lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Literally, his venture with the Lord, putting his trust in Jesus, almost instantly is met with people trying to kill him for his faith. And then we see a continued trend, a pattern. Paul is following the Lord, telling people all about Jesus, and then people rise up to kill him. We're going to talk about this a little later on. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was run over. People tried to throw him off a cliff. Like over and over again, he followed Jesus, told people about him. They would try to kill him. And eventually, he was carted off to Rome, who was in charge by a guy named, or led by a guy named Nero. If you guys know anything about Roman history and the fact that Nero basically set Rome on fire is the belief. Paul would later be killed for telling people about Jesus by this man named Nero. And as we jump into looking at him trusting the process, it's easy for, for, to feel like pastors get up and say, look at the Apostle Paul. Look how well he followed God. We all should feel guilty if we're not doing way more. And we should feel ashamed of our lives if it doesn't look like Paul's. But that's not the goal of our message. And that should never be the goal of our time in Scripture is for us to walk away in guilt or in shame that we have missed the boat. But instead, what we should do is look at people who faithfully followed the Lord. We should look at the results of their life. And if the results produce what God says, steadfastness, if it produces faithfulness and true joy and true fulfillment in their lives, then we should look to what they did and say, God, how do we walk in that same way? So I've got three things that Paul did that I think are worth us emulating as he did. And the first is this. Paul walk consistently with the Lord. People say that so often life is not a sprint, but it's a marathon. And I think that's a good phrase in so many things, especially being somebody who has uh, passed out 12 miles into a half marathon, which some of you have heard that story. It's true. Um, but here's the truth in life. So often we can get really excited and motivated to do good things or to make a big difference. But in reality, life is much better lived at a slower, consistent pace. And Paul could look like a sprinter based on the fact of how boldly he went and preached the gospel and all the great things he did. But what we see is that he was steadfast. Even before he came to know Jesus, he was a steadfast, devout Jew. He would probably daily study the scriptures, memorizing the first five books of the Bible, continually going back to his teachings. So when we read that he encountered Jesus, his results should not be that Paul all of a sudden had this huge urge in him to go and do something he's never done before. It was just he was living his consistent life now in light of Jesus. Acts 9, right before he gets, tries to be killed, tells us this. Paul, as soon as the scales fell from his eyes, spent several days with the disciples in Damascus in verse 19. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem amongst those who call on his name? 
And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners and to the chief priests? Yet Paul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Again, Paul would be in the synagogue, the Jewish church preaching the truth that he knew. And after he comes to know Jesus, he faithfully, consistently walks with the Lord. And it's important to note Paul's personality. Paul was probably a very, very strong-willed man. We see that he was very black and white. Truth was truth, and it can't be altered. And when he believed something, he went fully for it. He was not afraid to do what was right, even to the point of death or getting beat up for it. He would give up everything to progress his mission. And the reason that this man was so diligent and so faithful is because he daily spent time with the Lord. He lived out what the writer of Hebrews encourages us to do. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, since so many before us have walked with the Lord, and God blesses those who faithfully surrender to him, it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So often, if you're like me, our relationship with God can feel kind of like a roller coaster. At times, we feel like we hit such a high. Like we're walking with the Lord, like our hearts have a desire to follow him. And then life comes along and it almost feels like our faith plummets. Like we're not close to the Lord. Like we don't have a desire to follow him. Like going to church, even though we're looking for him, we just don't feel him there. We feel like God is distant. And so often, again, if you're like me, I feel like, what's the key? Like what's the trick to be steadfast in the Lord? And the answer is nothing magical. It's nothing crazy. It's just being consistent. Saying, God, I know you're real and I know I'm prone to water, but every day, every week, every opportunity in my life, I am going to sacrifice myself and turn my heart to you. And I shared a couple weeks ago at the beginning of this series, C.S. Lewis's words that he talked about is the biggest challenge we face every day is waking up and looking in the mirror and saying, today, I'm not going to live for myself, but I'm going to set my sights on Jesus. One of our elders, Andy, was uh, telling me a story, and it's been told in in many books, and I did some research on it because I think it applies to this point. And it's about the first men who went to the South Pole. Now, a little fun fact. The North Pole is pretty cool. You know who lives there? The man himself, Santa Claus. Um, But the North Pole is, like, pretty calm and cool and collected compared to the South Pole. You see, the North Pole is all ice, but the South Pole is actually land. Surprise, it's called Antarctica. And because there's actual land there, the amount of frost and snow builds up the elevation to be 9,000 feet at the South Pole. To put that in perspective, you have to not only get there and climb up 9,000 feet from water level or sea level, but at that point it's much colder and it's much more deadly. And for thousands of years, nobody had done it. That is until the early 19th, or uh, sorry, 20th, uh, 20th century, 1910s. There was actually two groups that set out to be the first ones to reach the South Pole. The first was led by a man named Robert Falcon Scott. And I'm not sure, but I think this might be where the phrase Great Scott comes from. That was a joke. That's not. He was a British Royal Navy officer. He was a researcher. He had done so many excursions. And he set out with a group of men to go to the South Pole. But then there was another man. He was kind of a younger, newer guy. And he was Norwegian. Where are my Norwegians at? Am I right? Woo! Yeah, all the pasty white people have their hands up. Cool. Anyway, um, and so this man, his name was Roland um, Amundsen. I can't say his name. But he had these new techniques. He was going to bring some machines. He was going to bring ponies, and he was going to bring these new sled dogs. Eventually, the machines and the ponies didn't really work, and he could just use sled dogs, just like the other guy, Robert Falcon Scott. So what it came down to, two crews, the same size, 
the same equipment after the other new fancy stuff went away. And here's the thing. One of them made, actually two of them made it to the South Pole. One of the groups made it out alive. They had two simple methods. One of their methods was every day their goal was to go 20 miles. No matter the weather, no matter the circumstance, their, no matter the difficulty, 20 miles every day. The other group, their goal was when the weather was nice and the wind wasn't blowing and things were easy, they would want to go 40 or 60 miles. And then on the days when the weather was harsh, when they weren't feeling it, when it seemed better to stay in camp, they would rest on those days and wait till the sunshine. Which one do you think made it there first? The 20 mile a day group. Which one do you think made it back home alive? The 20 mile a day group. You see, the 20 mile a day group showed up first in their consistency and then they got out safe. The other man, Robert Scott, who had been waiting his whole life, who was not this new explorer, but was long in the tooth and had been around, made it there second. And to his dismay and, and just feeling of defeat, he showed up and somebody had already been there. And the way they died, was on their way home in a really bad storm they decided to rest and all of the men died in their sleep I think that's an important story for us that so often we can ride the waves of success in our relationship with God but he calls us to something so much more he says don't just follow me when it's easy don't just put your trust in me when everything is clicking and everything's working right Instead, give your life to me wholly every day, making progress in me and trusting in me. And that's what Paul did so well. He walked consistently with the Lord. The second thing he did is that Paul trusted the Lord over his circumstances. Paul went through a ton of trying times, and he never seemed to stumble. In fact, on his very first missionary journey, where his goal was, you know what? Already he was going out to all the churches and all the synagogues and telling them, hey, let's stay true to Yahweh. Let's not follow this Jesus character. He comes to know the Lord and he's like, okay, I got to still go to these synagogues and I got to tell them about Jesus. So on his first journey out, Acts 14 tells us that after he told Jews in the synagogue about the one true God, Yahweh, verse 19 tells us that they stoned Paul. They literally all got together and threw rocks at him to murder him, and they dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But he wasn't. And it says the disciples gathered around him, healed him up, and he got back up, and he went back into the town. And you're like, wow, this guy was dumb, right? That's my thought. I'm honest. But you know what he did? is Paul trusted the Lord over his circumstances. Later on, Paul hears about Christians and they're boasting. They're like celebrating in the fact of like, I've done so much for God. Look at all the difficulty I've been through. Like I have like taken on such a burden to follow the Lord. And Paul goes on and he goes, that kind of talk's ridiculous. Just follow the Lord, boast about him. Don't boast about yourself. And then Paul kind of goes on a rant, which I really appreciate in his writing, just being honest. He's like, I'm sick and tired of you guys bragging. And he goes, if I could, if I wanted to, I could brag all day long. I probably shouldn't. But you know what? I'm going to. And he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more frequently, and I have been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. And Judaism, and we read about this in the Pentateuch, is somebody who was not following the Lord but didn't deserve to be killed, they would give them 40 lashes minus one. Because they would say that if you gave them full 40, they would die. And so one less would keep them alive and so not killing. He says he's had that done to him five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I was pelted with stones. We just talked about that. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the country, in the sea, from false believers. I've labored and toiled. I've gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And saying those things, again, like I said at the beginning, 
It can feel like a guilt trip. But that was not Paul's goal. His goal in saying all of this is, you know what? I've suffered a lot. And we're all called to suffer a lot. But when we trust in the Lord, when we look past our current circumstances and put our eyes on him, even when it doesn't make sense, that's when we actually find the hope and the joy and the fulfillment we are all desperately looking for in this life. Paul realized that amongst the difficulties in his life, that your posture in life is entirely dependent on where your focus is. I'll say that again because I think it's important. Paul realized amongst the difficulties of this life that your posture in life is entirely dependent on where your focus is. He was calling out to people whose focus was down. They're looking at their own circumstances, looking at their life, and he says, instead, look up and keep your eyes on Jesus. And he says this as the why in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul continually trusted the Lord over his circumstances by keeping his eyes on Jesus. And a, a very practical illustration of this, I can't talk about biking too much or else people roll their eyes, but in mountain biking especially, the number one biggest mistake that anybody new riding a bike does is they keep all their focus right in front of them. Literally, if you've ever been on a bike of any sort and you start going down something steep or scary, the first thing you do is like, I see where my wheel is going and I'm going to look right in front of my wheel because if there's a rock there, know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get out of the way. You know what happens? All of a sudden you're going too fast and you're looking right in front of you that you don't look up and you see like a 20 foot jump that you're about to go and like hit your face on, right? So for new riders, what happens all the time is they're looking right down and there will be turns coming up or huge trees or big bumps. And it's like, if you're looking down, you're gonna get completely wrecked. I have some video of people getting completely wrecked doing that same thing. Do you know what the simple solution is? Look up. Put your eyes up and look a little further down the trail. And the crazy thing is, is that we get so worried about the bumps in front of us that we think if we look up, we're going to get wrecked because we're going to miss the little things ahead. But the truth is this. When you look up, you see them way further ahead, but you also realize at the pace you're going and at everything else in front of it, that those little bumps that look huge in front of you, when you keep your perspective on the right spot, actually don't look that big so you can keep moving forward. In the same way, when we look down at our lives, about the difficulty we're in, and it is true difficulty, there's no doubt about it, or about when we don't feel close to the Lord, or we feel like we're missing something, when we look down and get stuck and we just wallow in these situations, things feel so detrimental. But when we put our eyes on Jesus, when we have healthy perspective, all of a sudden he shines light of the truth of our circumstances, both in their difficulties and how he can use them and walk us through them. Paul's encouragement is that he trusted the Lord over his circumstances. And the third thing that Paul did super well is that Paul rested in God's power, not his own. I feel like I say it a lot, but I think it needs to be said even more. The world we live in is rough, and we feel it. And every time I read the words of David, or as I was reading in my quiet time this week, the words of Moses, where he goes, God, don't make me lead these people. Just take me already. Like, I resonate with those. It's like, I want to be in heaven with the Lord because we battle. We battle the flesh. We battle the guilt and the shame we feel in our lives. We battle the fact that the enemy is all around us, that Satan is the prince of this world and he works behind the scenes and we don't even realize it. We battle our culture. We battle our own setbacks. And we ask ourselves, how do we stand firm? The only option we have is we need to put our rest, not in our own power, but in God's. Jesus was clear in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
John 16, Jesus says almost the same thing, but in a different phrase, he says this, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul's answer to the pressure and the difficulty and the turmoil of this world is not to pull himself up by the bootstraps. And we get this wrong. We look at Paul and we say, well, if we just work harder, if we just have more faith, if we would just suffer a little more, then everything's going to be fine. But that's not what Paul said. Paul said, when I am weak, then Christ is strong. When I can't do it, I put my trust and rest in him. Paul is not a man who is this strong tower that's built on his own. Paul is continually a wrecked man that's a puddle on the ground saying, I've got nothing going for me. The only thing I have is Jesus. He continually rested in the Lord and encouraged anybody who follows Jesus. Don't do it by your own power. It doesn't work that way. Trust in the Lord. That's why again he says in 2 Corinthians, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. His point is saying, the truth of the gospel becomes so great when we realize how broken and lost and lonely we are on our own. The truth of the gospel that we try to share every week here at Northlake is that when you don't have the life-giving truth of Jesus, when you try to live life on your own, you try to find happiness, you try to find fulfillment, and yet everything we do comes up short. No amount of fame or money or pleasure fills us up. We always have a hole, and the only thing that can fill that is putting our trust in Jesus, resting in the one who actually gives us fulfillment, who actually brings us joy. But here's the problem. We accept Jesus, and we can come to church, or we can gather with other believers, and we can hear, hey, continually, daily, surrender to the Lord. And we go, yeah, I, I do. I'm not perfect, but I'm, but I'm doing it. And then we say, well, put your trust in the Lord, even if things get difficult. And we go, yeah, things are difficult, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm not perfect, but I'm doing it. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes I feel like I'm doing all the right things, and yet I feel exhausted, and I feel worn out, and I feel all alone. And I think the thing we miss that we can miss in someone like Paul's life is the amount of rest that he had and found in Jesus. Paul spent years ministering in each city. Paul spent copious amounts of time in prison. Paul was a man that was always on the move, and yet was never moving too fast. And as a devout Jew, the one thing that he probably nailed much more than all of us or any of us is the idea of a Sabbath. You see, in Judaism, one day a week was set apart to find true rest, to remind ourselves who our true rest is in. Rest does not come from one or two vacations a year. Rest does not come from one or two drinks in the evening in our living rooms watching Netflix. Rest does not come from going to the beach in the summertime. That ain't it. True rest can only be found in Jesus. Paul showed us the great example of not just daily being with the Lord and not just trusting him in the difficulty, but regularly sitting back and saying, God, I need your rest and your presence because I can't do it alone. As I think about this whole topic of trusting the process and the life of Paul and summing up this message, I I came up with this big idea. God designed life to be best lived by walking with, trusting in, and finding rest in Jesus. And as I was thinking about this message and preparing for today, I was like, man, I feel like this is what often happens when I study God's word. The things that we're called to do are not complex, and they're things that I've heard before, and yet that's exactly what Jesus calls us to. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What he meant was following me is not complex, it's very clear. Walk with me daily, trust me in the difficulty, and find your rest. But just because something is easy does not mean it is not challenging. And so as we leave here today and we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, here's my question for you. What are those three things? Walking with the Lord, trusting in Him, and finding rest. Which of those, if you're honest, you realize 
hey, you know what? I know I need to do that, but I think I'm falling short. James 4 tells us this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And again, it's not a guilt thing. It's not a shame thing, but it's the realization. What do we know that is good for us, but we're just missing out on? And some of you may be sitting here and you go, you know what? If I'm honest, Pastor, I know that Jesus died for me. I, I, I know there is a real God. But if I'm honest, I'm not walking with him. And if you want to know what walking with him means, it's what I said. It's daily looking in the mirror saying, God, I'm going to give up what I want for you. It's opening up his word and not just reading it to check off a box, but saying, God, help me learn who you are and how to live by you. For some of you, it may be the fact that you haven't been in other community. You don't have other believers around you to help you continually walk in the Lord in every step. Maybe your takeaway leaving today is that you need to think about how do I orient my life around the truth of who Jesus is and in focusing on that, start walking more in step with him. For others of you, your takeaway may be you're, you're lacking trust. And this trusting the process series is good for you because you realize you're missing that trust out. But in reality, if you're really honest, you're holding on too tightly and you got to let go. Maybe your eyes are down and you're so stuck in your circumstance or you're so stuck and how tired and sick and tired you are being sick and tired. And Jesus is calling out and he says, will you just look up? Will you just trust me? My encouragement for you is that it's not easy. There's no perfect plan. But simply giving your heart to the Lord. Say, Jesus, put my focus on you. Help me not be so stuck in my own circumstance. And then lastly, some of you, maybe if you're honest, you're, you're walking with the Lord and you're trusting in him, but you're just tired. And we did a great series on a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Talked about the truth of scripture of rest and Sabbath and space. And if you're like me, those truths are great. But if you look at your life now, you may say, you know what, I've kind of missed some of those things. And for you, you may spend so much time doing good things for God and checking the boxes that you haven't actually taken the time to pause and rest in him. Maybe rest is the best thing for you to be alone with your Savior in a beautiful relationship and say, God, I want to grow more deeply in love with who you are. Not the things you give me, not the commandments you give me, but just in who you are to rest. So I was sitting in that room when I was at camp and they said three simple things. We will walk, you will trust us, all will rest. We were supposed to go to sleep early that night at 8 p.m. because we had to wake up at, I think, midnight in order to go on the hike. I didn't sleep a wink. Midnight came, I was the first one with my backpack on, and I'll never forgetting hiking up that mountain in the middle of the night. Four and a half miles up, 4,000 feet of elevation. And all I remember is taking one step in front of the other. And probably about the first half hour of going pretty slow, we stopped and we took a break. And I was so mad. Why are we stopping? This is ridiculous. What are you guys, a bunch of wusses? Let's keep going. We got a long way to go up. And my leader just came over to me because, believe it or not, I was kind of a handful as a child. <laughs> and he says, Josh, all will rest. And you may not need it now, but a time will come when you might want it more desperately than you realize. And also, don't forget, we're doing this together. So sure enough, step after step, break after break, trust after trust, we made it to the top. And not only did we make it to the top, it's like they've done this before. We made it to the top 20 minutes before sunrise. We're sitting up there, a bunch of fourth and fifth graders and a couple of leaders, and the sun comes up, and you just feel this feeling of like, wow, I did it. And I'll never forget coming back into the camp, in the van, and everyone cheers us as we're walking in, and we go down to the dock, and we jump in the dock, and I'm just like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? Is that in the middle of the hike, when it was sweaty and hot, even in the middle of the night, and when my legs were stumbling and I had a huge pack on, and I was so excited at the beginning, yet I was almost like passing out later on, I kind of have a problem with that. Nobody got to see that. They just got to see the highlight. They just got to see the victory. 
And then I think back to what our leader said in that meeting before he said the three things that you do, we will do. We will walk, you will trust, and all will rest. He said the most important advice. And anybody can make it to the top. All they have to do is be committed and set your eyes on the prize. When it comes to Jesus, I think that's our call today. Anybody can find the rest and find the trust and consistency with Jesus. Anybody, no matter how good you are or bad you are, no matter how many good things you've done or bad things you've done, no matter how far you feel or how close you feel, it simply comes from doing three things. Walking daily with the Lord, trusting in Him, and finding rest. Let me pray. God, I thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul. I thank you for his steadfastness. And God, I have to admit, it's pretty easy to look at his life and go, man, that guy was radical. That guy was crazy. I can't do anything like he can. But Lord, you don't call us to live a life exactly like Paul. God, you don't call us to do things outside of our abilities. All you do is call us to be faithful to you. So God, my prayer for us is that each of us would take an inventory on our lives and be honest, whether it's one thing, two, or all three, and say, Lord, where do we need to surrender to you? How do we need to be steadfast in who you are and trusting you and resting in you? And my prayer is that as we find these three things, is God, that we would feel illuminated and brightened to share the truth of who you are to the whole world, our one true calling, Lord, to be your disciples and share the good news about who you are. So God, we thank you for this time this morning. And God, I pray that we would just uh, carry this moment and carry you into the rest of our day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, church, thank you as always for coming here today and celebrating as we saw Nate be baptized and worship with the Lord. Honestly, not a more perfect Sunday to be outside. We've got one or two more weeks of outside. Of course, we've got dinner groups coming up, and then we'll get back to our two services indoors about mid-September. All right, that's it. Don't forget, we will walk, you will trust, and all will rest. Amen? Amen. God bless you.